Hello, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and today I'll be discussing an approach to polyuria. First, what is polyuria? It has a simple and objective definition. The production of more than 3 liters of urine within a 24-hour period. It's important to distinguish polyuria from two similar and overlapping pathologies. Urinary frequency is an increase in the number of times a person voids, irrespective of the net volume produced. So imagine a person who urinates 10 times in one day, producing 200 milliliters each time. That would be urinary frequency, but not polyuria. Alternatively, in a much less common situation, another person might urinate three times in one day, squeezing out one liter each time, which is probably not healthy. That's polyuria, not urinary frequency. And last is nocturia which is a subtype of urinary frequency that is predominantly confined to the nighttime hours when the patient is supine. Another way to look at this is with a classic Venn diagram. Urinary frequency is a more common problem than either nocturia or polyuria. All of nocturia is a subset of frequency, and almost all of polyuria is also a subset of frequency. But nocturia and polyuria themselves essentially don't coexist. The best diagnostic framework for polyuria categorizes etiologies based on their physiologic mechanism. The main categories are thus too much water, too much solute delivered to the renal tubules, resulting in an osmotic diuresis, or a defect in the tubular reabsorption of water, also known as diabetes insipidus. To remind you of some renal and endocrine physiology, the tubular reabsorption of water is primarily dependent upon the hormone ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone. As your serum sodium and thus serum osmolality increase, your hypothalamic pituitary axis releases more ADH into the circulation, which then travels to the kidneys and tells the kidneys to hold on to more water, reducing the volume of urine produced. So if there's a problem with the tubular reabsorption of water, it means there must be a problem with ADH. And the last category in the framework is polyuria mimics, which are conditions causing increased urine frequency without increasing total urine volume. Now, I'll go back and go through each category. Excess intake of water is not common, but when it occurs, it may be the result of primary polydipsia, which itself is usually a manifestation of psychosis, thus the near synonym psychogenic polydipsia. When it comes to excess tubular solute, this can be further broken down by the specific solute. Excess sodium in the tubules is caused by conventional diuretics, such as looped and thiazide diuretics, now is a good time to mention that the administration of a large volume of IV fluids spans both excess water and excess sodium. Excess glucose is seen in either poorly controlled diabetes mellitus or in treatment with SGLT2 inhibitors, also known as gliflozins, which prevent the reabsorption of filtered glucose in the proximal convoluted tubule. The last major solute that can lead to an osmotic diuresis is mannitol, which is a medication rarely used specifically for this purpose. I already mentioned that a defect in the tubular reabsorption of water is also known as diabetes insipidus, or DI. There are two major types of DI. Central DI, due to low production of the hormone ADH by the hypothalamus, and nephrogenic DI, due to renal resistance to ADH. Central DI is often idiopathic, but can also be caused by neurosurgery, head trauma, infiltrative disease such as sarcoidosis, hypoxic injury, and tumors. Nephrogenic DI can be hereditary, caused by lithium use, or hypercalcemia. Last are the mimics, which as previously mentioned are collectively much more common than causes of true polyuria. Diseases in this category include urinary tract infections, benign prostatic hyperplasia, and detrusor overactivity, colloquially known as an overactive bladder. Of all these, the most common causes of true polyuria are diuretic use and poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. I'll move on to discuss the evaluation of a patient reporting polyuria. In the history, the first step is to distinguish between polyuria, frequency, and nocturia. Ask about the chronology of the polyuria, such as the age of onset, and whether it was abrupt or gradual. What other urinary symptoms are present? For example, dysuria, hematuria, urgency, and incontinence. 
What about associated non-urinary symptoms, such as thirst, polydipsia, which is excessive consumption of water, and polyphagia, which is excessive consumption of food? The triad of thirst, polyuria, and polyphagia is classic for uncontrolled diabetes. Speaking of which, when asking the patient about their past medical history, focus on diabetes, neurologic disease, and psychotic disorders. And take a thorough medication history, including over-the-counters, supplements, and herbals. In a patient presenting with polyuria, an appropriately focused physical exam can usually be really brief. Consider the vitals and volume status more generally, and if there is concern for BPH, a rectal exam is indicated. For most patients, unless there is something else that came out of the history, that's really it for their indicated exam. Key labs for these patients, a metabolic panel and a urinalysis, commonly known as a UA, preferably with microscopy to aid in a potential diagnosis of a UTI. The diagnostic algorithm starts with determining from history whether the patient has true polyuria or frequency without polyuria. If they have frequency without polyuria, and if it is acute onset with or without dysuria and or hematuria, consider a UTI. If the frequency is of slowly progressive onset with or without urinary urgency and with or without incontinence, consider detrusor overactivity, BPH, and bladder outlet obstruction. Pursue additional workup as indicated. But if you determine your patient has true polyuria, the most obvious next question is, are they on a diuretic? If yes, consider a diagnostic and therapeutic dose reduction. If they are not on a diuretic, or if lowering the dose of the diuretic did not help, consider the basic metabolic panel and UA. If there is significant glucosuria on the UA and or significant hyperglycemia, the patient likely just has poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. If there is hyponatremia, that is low serum sodium, without significant hyperglycemia, that's suggesting primary polydipsia. Confirmation via a formal water deprivation test can be done, but is rarely necessary since the history usually supports the diagnosis enough to rule it in at this point. And if the UA is normal, the serum glucose is normal, and the serum sodium is either normal or high, it suggests the patient has diabetes insipidus. This should be worked up with a water deprivation test. What exactly is that test? Well, here's the basic principle of how it works. The urine osmolality and urine volume are measured every hour starting from the moment the patient is restricted completely from all fluids. The normal response in individuals deprived of water is for their serum sodium and serum osmolality to slowly increase which then triggers release of increasing amounts of ADH from the hypothalamus. So when looking at the urine, its osmolality will start to rise as well, doing so in an S-shaped curve over the first couple of hours, and then leveling off somewhere between 800 and 1,000 milliosms per kilogram. When the serum osmolality reaches around 290 to 295, corresponding to a serum sodium of around 145, with a little bit of person-to-person -person variability. At this point, ADH receptors in the kidneys are maximally stimulated. In patients with primary polydipsia, they're still making ADH and the kidneys are still responding to it, so their urine osmolality curve during the water deprivation test looks similar to that of a normal individual. The only differences are that their initial urine osmolality should be very low, no greater than 100, and some references show their maximum urine osmolality that is the maximum that their urine can be concentrated, as being just a little bit lower than normal. Compare that to patients with both forms of diabetes insipidus. Their urine osmolality starts off equally low as primary polydipsia, but because they either don't make or don't respond to ADH, as their serum osmolality is increasing over time, they are unable to increase the concentration of their urine, so the urine osmolality is minimally affected. As part of the test protocol, if the urine osmolality stabilizes at a subnormal level, desmopressin, a synthetic analog of ADH, is given to the patient. As you might expect, in patients with central DI who don't make their own ADH, the kidneys immediately respond to the exogenous desmopressin and urine osmolality immediately shoots up. 
while in patients with nephrogenic DI, their endogenous ADH levels are already very high, so providing the desmopressin does not have any effect. The kidneys just don't respond to it. There's more nuance to the water deprivation test protocol and to the diagnosis of DI in general, but this overview provides you a basic idea of how it works and will usually allow you to differentiate central from nephrogenic DI. Key takeaway points for polyuria. Polyuria is defined as an objective increase in the volume of urine produced per day. It must be distinguished from urinary frequency, which is generally more common. The most common etiologies of true polyuria are diuretic use and hyperglycemia. And while less common, diabetes insipidus is another important etiology, which is diagnosed via the water deprivation test that can also distinguish between the central and nephrogenic subtypes.